This is our first post no ruse event. So happy new year to all of you who celebrate uh, and those of you who don't should. <laughs> <laughs> this is really the best time of the year to have new year, the first of spring. And uh, so I'm hoping that uh, one of these days we're going to change the calendar <laughs> and, uh, and have no ruse as our new year. So today is uh, my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, um, Professor Julia Hartley, uh, who is a lecturer in comparative literature uh, in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at Glasgow. <clears throat> uh, prior to Glasgow, she was a lecturer um, in comparative uh, literature at King's College uh, in London, and an early career fellow at the University of Warwick. Uh, she completed her BA, Master's, and Doctorate in 2016 in French and Italian literature at the University of Oxford. <clears throat> Uh, but that was not enough for uh, thirst for knowledge. <laughs> and in 2017, she got a second master's degree in Iranian studies at uh, uh, SOAS. <clears throat> She's uh, uh, from Brussels, Italian, British, and with great interest in uh, Iranian studies. And today I learned I didn't know that, that uh, spia means spies. Italian, so we are, yeah. we are in <laughs> very, very appropriately in <laughs> Italian, <laughs> very appropriately we are in the nest of spies <laughs> today for this wonderful lecture on, um, on the, um, Dr. Hartley's uh, new book, Iran and French Orientalism, a fascinating book. Uh, and uh, for those of you, uh, this just came out uh, uh, last year by Ibi Torres uh, in London. Um, and uh, those of you, Ibi Torres publishes incredible books, uh, unfortunately with high price. Yes, very and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, if the price is determined by the substance, it, it makes perfect <laughs> sense, you know. And, uh, but I have uh, some uh, sort of uh, uh, discount uh, uh, code here. And for those of you who decide after this talk that you need to rush and order this yeah. book, I'm going to leave this uh, here. And you can take a copy of that. And please help me to welcome Dr. Hartley. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me all right? I think I turned it on. Yes, it's got a little green light. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me. It's my first time giving a guest lecture at Princeton. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so in my book, Iran and French Orientalism, I argue that Iran held a unique place in 19th century France. But Iran was, yet, yes, considered part of the Orient. But at the same time, Iran was admired among all other Oriental nat nations. And so French interest in Iran took many forms. Um, these writers, these artists might be interested in Achaemenid history, classical poetry, Safavid architecture, linguistics, the history of religion. Um, and it's really a time where we see French interests in Iran being at its height. But what I found when I started undertaking this project was that it's not really talked about. Um, when people think of Iran and France, they tend to think of the 18th century, Montesquieu's Persian letters. Um, and I believe a reason for that is in 19th century French studies, um, there tends to be two approaches. Either that of thinking about Orientalism in general, and so Iran is sort of thrown in with all other exotic locations and not seen in its cultural specificity, or there's a lot of research in post-colonial 19th century French studies on Iran's, oh, sorry, on France's colonial empire. And so Iran really slips through the net of these studies. And that's what I wanted to redress with this book. So the project was as much about unearthing a forgotten history of cross-cultural engagement as it was about analyzing the different examples of this engagement. And so that's why I chose to have a very broad scale. The book starts with a romantic period and ends in the early 20th century. And I look at lyric poetry, um, historiography, 
fiction, travel writing, and performing arts. And so to give you a sort of taste of that range today, I've chosen uh, to present three particular texts, each written in a different genre, but they're all connected by the fact that they're all engaging uh, with Ferdowsi's Jean Armé. So the Jean Armé appeared in its first complete European translation in the 19th century. Um, here you can see a photograph of me, uh, well, not me, but the books as I consulted them uh, in the British Library in London. And it really was a labor of love. It took 40 years to complete. Volume one appeared in 1837, um, and the final volume was published in 1874 um, after the death of Jules Moll, the translator, and was completed only through the intervention of his student. And so today, I'm going to look at how this text is a source of inspiration uh, for three different authors. And these are um, Jules Michelet in his uh, La Bible de l'Humanité, The Bible of Humanity, which is a history of world religions. We'll then move on to literary fiction with Judith Gauthier, uh, better remembered as the daughter of Théophile Gauthier, but a great writer in her own right, um, and her novel Iskandar, Histoire Persane. And then finally, we'll have uh, a ballet, Paul Ducasse, La Péri, Poème Dansé. And through these examples, I want to really demonstrate to you today, if there's sort of any takeaway that you can have, um, the really important role played by translation in changing how French people thought of Iran at the time. So in the 19th century, Iran really becomes associated with a body of literature, and we can talk about intertextuality, which I find a much more interesting conversation um, than a lot of the talk we have about sort of you know representing the Orient and it being having no bearing on reality. Um, and so what I found through this project is, is it, it adds a different layer to our understanding of Orientalism in two ways. First of all, I show that these French writers were interested in Iran qua Iran. They were interested in Iranian culture. This was not a vague fantasy, all-encompassing Orient. It was a very specific cultural engagement. And I've also found, and this goes against the idea of Orientalism being sort of this fixed, coherent discourse, that different writers responded very differently to Iran. And so we get this whole range of treatments shaped in particular by the choice of literary genre that they're writing in, which is why we're looking at three different genres today, um, and also the author's intention and their own background. Um, and I think it's really important to think of intertextuality here because what has been noted um, by several critics of Edward Said's Orientalism, you know, I think influentially James Clifford, um, but when Said talks about Orientalism, there's a focus on what is being represented. But we talk about how a culture is depicted in the West, but we don't really talk about what are the sources that are being engaged with. Um, so the phrase that Clifford um, uses for this is that in Orientalism, we never have more than a passing reference to the brute reality of the cultures and nations whose location is in the East. And thus, Orientalist inauthenticity is not answered by any authenticity. And so that's why I find it interesting today to look at the Shahnameh, an actual work of Persian literature and how it's being responded to by these authors. So we'll begin with Jules Michelet. Um, who here has heard of Michelet? It's a show of hands. Princeton is actually the home of a great Michelet scholar, uh, the late Lionel Gossman, who is one of the scholars uh, I read when preparing this chapter. And I find Michelet very unjustly forgotten. Um, I never studied Michelet as a student studying 19th century literature because we only looked at novels and poems. And so we did not look at histories. But actually, Michelet's histories were widely read and had a huge impact on the literary culture of the 19th century. Um, La Bible de l'Humanité is not widely studied. A lot of Michelet scholars tend to focus on his histories of France. But I find it a really exciting text. It's basically a history of world religions, starting with the birth of Hinduism in India and ending with medieval European Christianity. And it's all tied together as this big, cohesive, uh, epic narrative which makes it quite fun to read. This is how Michelet talks about the importance of studying ancient religions. He says, it is so often is the case that the most profound things are those that go unrecorded. Life as it was lived, acted, breathed. 
And so for Michelet, the study of religion is a way of understanding the fears, desires, and material <laughs> conditions of the ancient world. And he devotes a whole chapter of his book on Persia, the chapter is called La Perse, and it explores Zoroastrianism. And Michelet really idealized Zoroastrianism as sort of his alternative um, to the disappointing reality of the French Revolution. His argument in the book is the French Revolution promised a more just, more equal society. It failed. Um, but if we look at an ancient religion like Zoroastrianism, we can see how to actually practice justice. Um, there's a more sort of problematic side to this fascination of ancient Iran, which is that the book definitely buys into the Aryan myth. So today we might associate the Aryan myth with Germany, with Nazism. Actually, it was already existing in the French 19th century. Um, and it developed in response to the distinction between Indo-European languages and Semitic <laughs> languages. Um, and so Iran is seen as this ancestor of France. Uh, Michelet talks about nos parents les Arya, our parents the Aryans. And so he believes that this is France's cultural heritage as a modern Aryan nation. He writes, justice is not yesterday's foundling. She is the mistress and the heiress who wants to return home, the true lady of the house. She can say, I was born at dawn in the light of the Vedas. In the morn of Persia, I was pure energy in the heroism of work. However, there's this tension in the text as a whole where we have, on the one hand, this desire to emphasize humanity as a whole, right? The Bible of humanity, the title is a metaphor to say all the world's religions collectively form the Bible of humanity. But then in following this Aryan myth, Michelet is actually reproducing um, the narratives being promoted by thinkers such as uh, Gobineau in his essay on the inequality of human races and Ernest Renan. Um, so in investing this sort of perfect Aryan trinity formed by the Hindu Indians, Zoroastrian Persians and pagan Greeks, as the foundation of European civilization, there's an implicit opposition that's not so implicit um, if you look at the title of part two, right? The peoples of darkness, night, and chiaroscuro. So you might be wondering, what does all this have to do with the Shahnameh? Um, well, the Shahnameh is very interesting because it's in the moment in Michelet's chapter on Persia that he engages with the Shahnameh but he's suddenly able to push against these quite reductive racial oppositions of Aryan and Semites, sort of part one, part two. Um, and it's especially notable because in the 19th century, we have the beginning of a narrative, which I think has also uh, been assimilated in modern Iran, where um, Iran truly is Zoroastrian, therefore it is not Islamic, it is only Muslim on the surface, and that is justified as Aryan, Aryans um, practice Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism, um, Islam is a Semitic religion because Arabic is a Semitic language. And Michelet goes against this when he starts thinking about the Shahnameh. Uh, so this is how he describes what happens once Iran becomes Muslim. She remained under every empire, the holy soul and identity of Asia, surviving both through her direct descendants, the poor and honest Zoroastrians or Parsis, but especially, and even more so, in her indirect influence on her Muslim conquerors, on the innumerable tribes, sultans, and dynasties of all races that passed through. So this is quite innovative and radical for the time because Michelet is now suggesting um, that the Zoroastrian cultural legacy is not something that dies out with Islam, but something that becomes incorporated into Islamic Iran, which I think is something a lot of us can agree with now, but at the time was a very new view. And he shows in this way that the cultural heritage passes on uh, to Iranian Muslims, but also to non-Iranians, to the Muslim world in general. Um, and he writes that this sort of pre-Islamic uh, heritage of Iran, quote, vivifies the Muslim spirit, fills it with fruitful goodness and deep inspiration. And his evidence for this is the Shahnameh. The Shahnameh is where this spirit of free Islamic Iran is preserved and incorporated within the new Islamic culture. So without the Shahnameh, um, Michelet would not be able to make this strong claim for a much more sort of layered identity that goes beyond these racial demarcations. Um, and he's particularly excited about the female characters in the Shahnameh. So he writes, the heroines of his book, which remains faithful to true tradition, 
are of an ancient pride and grandeur. If they sin, it is certainly not out of weakness. They are tough and brave, show bold initiative, and are heroically faithful. Um, and he goes on to have a whole paragraph on female characters in Mishanami, which is a subject of recent PhD thesis, actually. So it's quite interesting to see that Michelet was already writing about that. So with Michelet, we have the use of Iran to sort of reject uh, the very narrow racialist understanding of Iran that you had free thinkers such as Gobineau, uh, who had claimed that the moment you know, Persians mix their blood, quote, uh, they are doomed to disappear. Uh, and Renan's suggestion that Islam is incompatible with Iranian identity. Um, these oppositions can be dissolved through the Shahnameh. With my second author today, Judith Gauthier, we have a similar urge uh, to dissolve binary oppositions. But this time, the opposition is not between Aryans and Semites, uh, or Muslims and Zoroastrians. It is between Greeks and Persians, and colonizer and colonized. So the book's title, Eskandar Histoire Persane, uh, refers to the Persian name of Alexander the Great, Eskandar. And there's a play on words in the subtitle, because histoire in French can both mean a story, but also a history. So this is a Persian history of Alexander, a Persian story of Alexander. And this is quite, again, if we think of sort of a theme in my talk today, this idea of pushing against the norm via a Persian text. So Michelet had pushed against those racialist narratives with Shahnameh. Shah With Gauthier, we have a pushing against the Western vision of Alexander the Great, which is very much that of a proto-Western conqueror, um, you know, figure idealized by Napoleon, who declared upon invading Egypt that he was following in the footsteps of Alexander. And we have a lot of that discourse even today, I find, in the US, uh, neo-imperialists loving Alexander. Um, and that is so different to the story told in the Shahnameh. Um, so for so a quick recap for those who are not aware of this, um, Ferdowsi um, incorporates this Persian legend around Alexander the Great that says that he is actually half Persian, that he is the secret child of the king of Iran and of Philip of Macedon's daughter. And so this creates this mixed race, mixed heritage Alexander, who is also, by virtue of being the oldest son of the king of Iran, the righteous heir to the throne. And so he's no longer this foreign invader. And this is also emphasized um, in a scene that Theodosi writes very beautiful, uh, where Dara, Darius dies uh, in the arms of Eskandar and sort of acknowledges him as the new king of Iran. And then we have a chapter transition from chapter 19 of Ashanameh, Shahnameh, Dara, to chapter 20, sorry, yeah, 20, Eskandar. So now Eskandar has gone from being foreign invader to being Iranian king. He's part of a roll call of Iranian kings. Um, and so it's interesting because, of course, it's a fiction, it's a piece of myth-making, but it does tap into historical truth, which was that in many ways, Alexander of Macedon was continuing Achaemenid rule. He was taking over a pre-existing empire. He was marrying into the royal family, trying to show himself as a successor to Darius rather than an outsider. And that's a version that's often lost uh, in Western treatments of Alexander that sort of hold him up as, yes, you know, Western civilization triumphing over the Middle East. This novel also clearly has um, a very personal resonance to Judith Gauthier because by really bringing out the theme of cultural transition, of Iskandar going from being king of Rum to king of Iran, um, Gauthier is also speaking to a personal yearning, which was, and this is where we have a bit of gossip, uh, the fact that she had been proposed to uh, by an Iranian diplomat named Mossen. Um, and Mossen had been turned down by her parents, um, apparently because he had a few other wives, so we can perhaps understand why. Um, but in her old age, uh, Judith Gauthier would sort of look back and think, oh, if, if instead of marrying my husband, Katul Mendes, I married Mossen, I might have lived in Iran and had this different life. Um, and so I think we can see that projection into this character of Eskandar, who goes from being European to Persian. But it's also um, such a statement against the French ideology of a mission civilisatrice, because uh, when the book first appeared as a novel, not in the press, in the 1880s, this was the time in which right-wing politicians were arguing that it was France's moral duty to go civilize um, Asia, to show you know, how to live, how to act, to export French civilization. And so 
Gucci, even though the, on the surface this is quite an apolitical novel, you know, you think, oh, Shana made it so distant, it's fantastical. She's actually doing quite a political act because she's telling the story of a foreigner who does not want to make Iran Greek, but he wants to make himself Iranian. He wants to assimilate to the local culture. Um, and this cultural hybridity of a character is matched by the hybridity of Gautier's writing. Um, so not only does she borrow the plot of a Shaname, what she does is she takes elements of a story, certain characters, events, and then she interpolates, adds her own um, episodes and adventures. But she's also stylistically imitating the Persian epic through her use of you know, lists and simile and hyperbole. Um, she uses the name Iran. She does not say la Perse. She says Iran from start to finish, which is what Ferdowsi calls Iran. Um, and there are many calks on the Persian language, such as to weep blood for to weep abundantly. Um, and she even has the phrase Rodbar in it. She says, je suis ton sacrifice, uh, as a polite turn of phrase in dialogues between the characters. Um, and then another layer is that as a framing device, she frames her entire novel as a performance by Naqal, who's performing the story of Alexander the Great. Um, so these are traditional Iranian coffeehouse storytellers. So we really see that there's just so many levels in which Gauthier is situating the novel in an Iranian context and as a homage to Ferdowsi. But she also innovates. And what I find really interesting is that the way in which she chooses to explore um, Eskandar's journey from being uh, from the West to being a worthy Iranian king is that she invents a new storyline in which Eskandar becomes best friends with Rostam. And so Rostam being the Hercules of Ashanameh, this very masculine uh, heroic figure. Um, who in the Shahnameh lives centuries before Eskandar, so they never meet in the poem. But what Gautier does is she gives Rostam a great, 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 great grandson who has the same name and is identical to Rostam. Um, and when I first started looking at this relationship, the first word that came to me was bromance. Um, but then I also realized the more I looked into it that there is quite a queer streak to this. And of course, we know that the historical Alexander had relations with men, so we can see why Gautier would have gone for that. But what makes it really interesting ideologically is that by having the emotional core of a novel being this relationship between two men, uh, both equally strong, uh, you know, masculine, heroic, Gautier is avoiding that Orientalist cliche of you know, the strong, conquering, masculine West and the feminized Orient. No, these are two heroes, and their friendship is one based on equality. At the same time, it's very emotionally rich uh, and has these erotic moments, uh, like them having a bath together or riding on a horse together. Um, so this is the scene, uh, the moment in which Eskandar meets Rostam, how this relationship is introduced in the novel. So at first, Eskandar sets out to meet Rostam to assert his authority. Right? He says, Rostam's insubordination would cast a shadow over my glory. He must submit. But then, once they actually meet, suddenly everything changes. So Eskandar finds Rostam weeping because he's mourning the death of his king, Dara, but he's also guilty that as a warrior he failed to protect his king. And Eskandar kneels uh, beside Rostam and comforts him. Eventually, he admits his identity, uh, to which Rostam exclaims, oh, my king. And then this is the telling moment. Um, Eskandar, who had set out to make Rostam submit, now refuses to let him perform the prostration. But Eskandar would not let him kneel. He put his arms around him and clasped him to his chest. This time, you are defeated, he said, kissing him tenderly. And it's this idea of you are defeated, I find really playful, because we've gone from this military context, context of war, of winning over as in prevailing over someone, and now we've gone to winning someone over to a seduction, to a proposal that's almost like a marriage proposal. Um, Eskandar tells Rostam, Under this until this day, I felt alone in the midst of my glory. I had climbed so high that I could have no equal. I had many subjects and not one friend. I would have had to bend in order to love, and my vanity refused to believe that there could exist a companion worthy of Eskandar. But you, you have given me the joy of being able to love without being charitable. Do not drive me mad, Iskandar, murmured Rostam, pressing his lips to the king's hands. 
you see what I mean about the queer undertones. Um, and so then they ride together on a rach, um, Rostam's worthy steed, into the capital city of Estach. And there's this moment where that relationship goes from being private to being public, where they appear in front of a population. And Gautier writes, the entire population could then see him with his hand resting on Rostam's shoulder. It could admire these two young men of equal beauty who seemed the reconciled gods of two enemy religions. And then as the novel unfolds, we basically have their friendship being put to the test, but always prevailing. Um, and the relationship between the two men comes before relationships with women, be they sexual or be they diplomatic, to do with you know, arranged marriages to secure Alexander's power. Um, the relationship between the two men always comes first. And so what I find really striking in this treatment is that the question of whether we should see the relationship as sexual or not is, is almost secondary, really, to the fact that this relationship really troubles that Orientalist logic I was telling you about, where you have a conquering Westerner and a passive, sort of submissive uh, Iranian character. And so when I was sort of thinking about this, I found it really resonated uh, with Foucault's observation that it is not sex between men that threatens institutions, but I quote, the unlikely alliances that result from love between men, those relations that create a short circuit and introduce love where there should be law, order, or habit. So with Ferdowsi, Gautier found this hybrid Alexander, and then she was really able to flesh it out by adding this further layer of the close emotional friendship between him and Rostam. And by choosing Rostam as his closest friend, Eskandar takes the first step towards asserting his Iranian identity, which comes to its climax later in the novel, where they stand in front of the army. And Eskandar, with Rostam as his witness, announces uh, the glorious country of Iran is my only homeland. So he's completely rejected by then his Western origins. So I'll move on now to my third and final example, uh, which is Paul Ducasse La Périr. And you have on this slide uh, the libretto, which you see is quite short if it's on the page. So it opens with the following sentence. It came to pass that in the final days of his youth, the Magi having observed that his star was paling, Eskandar traveled around Iran, searching for the flower of immortality. So from this opening sentence, we have the ballet being very explicitly set in Iran. Uh, Iran is referred to by its native name, but we also have references to Magi, so Zoroastrianism, and Alexander being called Eskandar, referred to by his Persian name. The plot of a quest for immortality is also taken from the Shahnameh, um, but Ducat rewrites it, sort of like Gautier takes elements of Shahnameh, but you know, adds her own touches. So here, instead of finding waters of immortality, Eskandar finds this lotus flower, which I think is probably an allusion to the Achaemenid imagery of kingship, um, and he eventually relinquishes it. Um, so he sees a pari, which is a Persian fairy, and the libretto writes, Iskandar, considering her, admired her face, which surpassed in delight even that of Gorda Farid. And within his heart, he desired her. And this comparison to Gorda Farid is really telling because this is Paul Ducat wanting us to know we are in the world of the Shahnameh. I'm naming a character from the Shahnameh. But that's not something you can communicate through choreography or costume, right? It's not really going to influence the ballet but it's just that to signpost. I have read the Shahnameh and I'm situating this ballet in that world. Um, and so what happens is that Eskandar, the invisible lord, takes the magical flower from the Paris. The Paris then does a ballet, seduces him, um, he returns the flower to her. And uh, it says Eskandar saw her disappear and understanding that he, this was a sign that his end was near, he felt the darkness closing on him. I find it really interesting how the libretto combines elements of how Alexander or Iskandari described in Western literature and the Shahnameh. So we had a lot of references to, to the Shahnameh, as I've just highlighted. But he's also referred to as the invincible lord, which sort of taps into that epithet unconquered, which is often used in classical literature to refer to Alexander. And also the way in which he learns about his impending death by being warned by priests is also, also taken from classical literature. Um, in the Shahnameh, rather more excitingly, Eskandar is warned by a talking tree. Um, and so readers, and I say readers because at ballet performances, um, this libretto would have been handed out as part of a program. 
are picking up on these clues, right? This character is called Eskandar. The name is never glossed. We're never told Eskandar is Alexander. But we have elements of Western tellings of Alexander. And that's the clue that it's one same figure. And we're picking up on different traditions of representation. Um, but of course, this libretto is only one part of experiencing the production. When you go to ballet, you go for music and choreography. I'd just like to play very briefly the sort of opening music. It's, I don't know if it, if it actually has a thing, it seems muted. Oh, it is working, great. So, the sort of more mysterious string and the bit you're about to hear now, that's the theme of the Paris, the sort of very mysterious, magical, concerning, which taps into a range of folk songs, but Paris are also dangerous. And whenever you hear the French horn, that is the music associated with Alexander. And I find that a really interesting way of picking up on this association of a historic Alexander, both in Western art and literature, but also Iranian art and literature, with warfare and hunting, and where you have these trumpets playing. Um, and this, again, this very sort of masculine identity of being off chasing and something. And then the visuals um, add yet another layer to all this. So there was an aborted production that was meant to premiere um, in 1911 of the Ballet Russe. But then after this production uh, was canceled, uh, the ballet was resurrected by its lead ballerina, Natalia Trujanova, and eventually premiered uh, with costumes and a set by René Pio. And I, I mean, I hope it's quite obvious from this slide the really detailed degree to which Pio is looking to Persian miniature art um, for inspiration. So in the set, we have a sort of flat background landscapes with in the foreground very detailed flowers and plants, which you'll get often in Persian miniatures, such as this one. Um, and I found it really playful uh, that the stage is framed by these hangings with foliage, which looks like the margins of Persian illuminated books. Uh, you often have foliage in the margins. Um, and the costume of Iskandar is clearly based um, on how he's represented in illustrations of a Shahname. So the typical way uh, of doing Iskandar the Persian style is not to dress him in a Macedonian outfit, uh, but to dress him in typical Iranian clothes of the era, in this case Safavid, and to decorate uh, his turban with two feathers um, as an allusion to Alexander's Macedonian helmet. And this is very much what Pio has felt faithfully done here. So, Whereas in the libretto, we have elements of Western and Iranian representations of Iskandar or Alexander, the set design and costume really makes him the Persian Alexander. I mean, in a long flowery dress and turban, um, this would not have been recognized as Alexander to sort of everyday French person. You would really have had to read the Shahnameh to have an awareness of Persian culture to understand that this character is also Alexander. So today, I've taken you through three examples of French intertextual engagements with the Shahnameh, spanning from the mid-19th century to the early 20th century. And the author's genre in which they were writing was just as important, I think, as intention uh, in shaping how each of them approached the Shahnameh. As a historian, Michelet engages with Ferdowsi for historical evidence. He's not necessarily interested in him as a writer, he wants to sort of show how Zoroastrianism can be cohesive with later phases of Iranian identity. And so the Shahnameh is a perfect illustration of this historical claim. As a novelist, Gautier is much more interested in Ferdowsi as a literary model. She's mining him for plot, characters, and style, but also bringing her own story to bear on Ferdowsi's world, that of an intimate friendship between two men from different cultures. So this is a very layered and dynamic example of intertextuality. And similarly to Gautier, Ducat takes inspiration from the Escandar chapters of a Shahnameh that he uses as a canvas to tell a new story. And given the altogether different medium of ballet, these allusions to Ferdowsi are obviously much more sparse. They function as clues planted for educated readers to pick up on 
from the libretto and then once it was produced from the costumes. Um, and so it's clear that while Ducat was aiming for more of a hybrid Alexander, the ultimate production was very much about the scandal of a Sean Armé. And as such, this is telling us something about the familiarity that was anticipated from audiences, right? Um, these creations presuppose that the audiences are aware that there is such a thing as the Sean Armé, that the Sean Armé tells a different story about Iran. And so this really exemplifies the turning point I identify in the 19th century. This is the time when suddenly French readers can read Ferdowsi, but also Sadi, Hayam, Hafez, for the more adventurous ones, Attar, Jami, Nizami, Rumi. Um, they're reading the Persian literary canon. And in this sense, they are not consuming a version of Iranian culture that's been you know, invented, created in the West, nor are they consuming a version of Iranian culture crafted in Iran for Western export. This is the classical Persian canon as it is read and studied to this day in Iran. And so they are discovering Persian literature on its own terms. Now, the caveat to this is, of course, they're all relying on translations. Um, and so their interactions with Iranian literature are very mediated. For example, a 19th century French reader would have an altogether understanding of Chayam based on whether they read Nicolas' French prose translation or Fitzgerald's uh, verse English translation. And that's why the Shahnameh -er is a particularly rich terrain for inquiry, because Mull's translation was so erudite, so accurate, it was really based on a deep philological and linguistic engagement with the text. So I hope to have convinced you today that these readers were genuinely reading Feridosi. Um, and my final thought is I find really uh, Judith Gauthier's Escandar one of the most exciting examples of how intertextuality can act as a powerful challenge to the reductive binaries of 19th century imperialism and of the Orientalist cliches uh, described by Said in Orientalism. Gautier blends together elements of both French literature and Persian literature. And the fact that the novel's protagonist transitions from identifying as Greek to identifying as Iranian only further drives home Gautier's fluid understanding of cultural and national boundaries. Gautier is not trying to represent a geographic or historical reality but in her free and dynamic rewriting of Ferdowsi, she pays homage to a cultural reality, that of Ferdowsi's Shahnameh -er and its enduring legacy. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Julie. That was a wonderful presentation and a lot to think about. I'll grab a pen so I can oh, write yeah, okay. questions. So we have time for, uh, I, I knew that Salar would raise his hand, so I go first to Salar and then. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Or yeah. is it work? Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. This was, this was amazing. Uh, so you talked about the, uh, like starting from mid 19th century onwards. And I have a question about the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, in which there is, for example, a translation of a uh, famous James, uh, J uh, James Muria's book, Haji Baba, mm -hmm. which depicts Iranian as like dishonest people. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, when do you think this shift, mm -hmm. if, ha if actually happened, it was the shift yeah. or, I mean, if it was, then what was the context for it? Mm -hmm. Or there were still some sort of like competing narrations in the mm -hmm. mid and the late 19th yeah. century. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great question. Uh, so my earliest text, I start in 1829 with Victor Hugo's Les Orientales, which was a sort of a turning point in romantic literature and has uh, Sadi and Hafez as epigraphs. Um, I think both your suggestions are true. So number one, yes, there is an evolution in that as the 19th century unfolds, um, the French public has more and more resources for learning about Iran. So a great part of that is increasing number of translations of classical literature, uh, but also travelogues, um, historical studies. And then by the late 19th century, you have the inauguration in the Louvre of the rooms with um, the remains of Sousa, uh, the archer's um, mosaic. And so there is a sense in which people get more and more information about Iran as the century unfolds. And I found one journalist even uh, reviewing an opera set in Iran, and he actually writes, uh, we know so much more about the Achaemenids than about countries and cultures much closer to us. So the French are really getting the sense of, yes, we have all this you know, knowledge about Iran. 
at the same time, yes, you do still have uh, different conflicting narratives. And I find my chapter on travel writing was really interesting because people traveling to the same cities around the same time would have entirely different opinions. Um, as, like you say, the cliche is about Iranians being untrustworthy, uh, but then another person will have a fantastic time and really enjoy it. And then what I found really funny was one same author, Flandin, writing in 1851, um, keeps contradicting himself. So the funniest thing is how they all have to handle Taros. Um, so at first they're like, oh, it's great, everyone's so nice. Of all the peoples in the world, the Persians are the most affable. Um, any socializing with them is so pleasant. And then 30 pages later, it's like, Iranians are the most deceitful, disingenuous people. You never know what they're actually thinking. Um, so even one same author can have very complete. You both are true. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any evidence that the Iranian intellectuals read him, mm -hmm. and if there were any exchanges with the Shasani, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. even up to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Um, so, to my knowledge, no, there wasn't any criticism. To go back to your first question, which is really interesting, that sort of idea of interaction and perceptions, I've not dealt with Iranian reactions to Michelet, but that whole narrative, I think, about Zoroastrianism being Iran's true identity definitely gets incorporated into late Iranian thought. So I would see an influence there. I do look at Ernest Renan's uh, debate with, with Al Afghani, which I find really interesting. Um, but they basically have a debate about uh, whether Islam is compatible uh, with science and an enlightenment. And what I find really striking is the end of that debate where Al Afghani comes to convince Renan on certain points. And how does Renan admit, OK, this guy has something to say? He says, oh, yes, Al Afghani, you know, he reminds me of Ibn Rushd and all these great thinkers. And you know, it's not surprising. He's Aryan. Um, so of course, he's very smart. And so it's quite funny because then he uses that to confirm his own sort of racialist narrative. So for an Afghani, you feel like you can't win, basically. <laughs> you always end up being incorporated back into the grand narrative. Uh, you start your book by mentioning that this took its beginning from some work by William Jones yeah. in connection with, yeah. and the legal language that he saw was Persian at times. But I'm curious why you think that uh, Jones's work is thought of mostly in terms of the recognition of what Sanskrit is mm -hmm. in Anglo countries and had this effect mm -hmm. in France, which is quite a different kind of effect yeah. of his work. Yeah, so it's interesting because Jones is remembered for uh, his essay thought of in English on the poetry of the Eastern nations, but actually it first appeared in French two years before that. Um, and it was part of the book that was a history of Nader Shah. Um, so you had this history written in French of Nader Shah, then an essay uh, on Oriental poetry in general, but really he's praising Persian poetry as his favorite. And these are the first translations of Hafez in French. It also includes translations of Hafez. Um, and then the last page of the book has currency exchange, which I find quite funny. It says, everything you need for going to Iran, uh, Nader Shah Hafez uh, exchange rates. Um, but I think what's key is that he's such an early advocate for the study of, um, he says Oriental languages in general, but I keep seeing his predilection for Persian in that essay. Um, the importance of studying it and teaching it at university. Uh, and arguing that you know, a really informed understanding of literature is world literature. And Hugo, in his preface to Les Orientales, which is such a romantic manifesto, is very much repeating the same ideas. Um, so that's what got me interested. I think there was probably affiliation there. Uh, the French intellectuals read that essay in French, and it was part of their sort of way they articulated the importance and relevance uh, of studying Persian literature. Quick question. Um, what's at stake for the uh, Jules Michelet, the sort of 
founder of sort of modern French historiography and the mm. you know sort of author of the Histoire de France to go back to the Zoroastrianism as you mentioned mm -hmm. in the wake of the failure of the promise of the French Revolution. Yeah. Can you can you say s something? I mean, particularly because this is not your run of the middle Orientalist. I mean, he's yeah. he's sort of the sort of founder of the French school of historiography and yes. historicism. Yeah. No, I find it really interesting because he's remembered really for his histories of France, and I found very little scholarship on this text. Um, I think he's very disillusioned, not just with the French Revolution, uh, but also the Christian religion. Um, and around the time he wrote the, wrote the book, he'd also lost his uh, place at the Collège de France. Um, so he was in a tough spot professionally. He was also, this was quite funny, I read his diaries, and he says he also wrote the book uh, to fight Renan. And he literally writes in his diary that he wrote the book Contre Renan et le Christ. Mm. It's quite an ambitious battle to take, because um, Renan was his former student and then ended up doing great as an academic. Um, so I think he can't find this idea of morality of just society near him, whether it's in Christianity or recent European history. So then he has to look elsewhere. Um, why Zoroastrianism? I think it's new at the time, right? It's sort of the emergence after Anquetil du Coran uh, in the late 18th century, they start being sort of more translations of the Vedas. Um, he's also very excited about Hinduism. So I look at that less, obviously, because I'm more interested in Iran. So I think there's this sense of excitement and marvel and delight of finding an alternative worldview that he has not seen before, and then he can anchor himself on it. But then it almost becomes a projection, because then he makes it mean whatever he wants, right? Um, so he ends up saying things like, oh, this is the true justice of the French Revolution is here. And you think, well, that was several millennia before, so that's quite hard to justify. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, would you say that we can say that specifically Gustia and Michelet mm -hmm. were reflecting on contemporary French domestic moods surrounding mm -hmm. fears of degeneration? Yeah. interesting question. I've actually worked on an edited volume, which was on French decadence and exoticism, which was very much not looking at these texts, but yeah, reflect, reflecting on these issues. So hybridity, it's huge in Gobineau, in racialist theory, right? This paranoia about miscegenation. And so it's definitely pushing against those narratives, uh, I'd say very consciously. Um, in terms of relation with Germany, uh, it's interesting because Gautier, I believe, had an affair with Wagner at one point. So definitely um, not afraid of interacting with Germans. Um, the book first appears before the Franco-Prussian War in the newspaper, but then it gains fame after it by being published as a book in the 1880s. So I'm sure to readers, they would have felt it was a huge statement uh, against that fear of the other. Um, also fears, like you said, degeneration, decline, um, because then that fuels the mission civilisatrice, right? How do we prove we are not declining by colonizing other nations? And so the ideology of the book is so against all of that. And so one anecdote that illustrates that is I found uh, a book review 
from 1890s, I think it was the second issue of a novel, and the reviewer said, don't give this to your children. <laughs> this is not the Alexander the Great were meant to know about, so I don't recommend this book for children. So you saw, you could see there was a discomfort, definitely, of her telling a different story there, yeah. Does this work? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. So I have, a, I have a basic question, which is when you started, you said you were arguing that these three authors were interested in Iran, qua Iran, mm -hmm. but then in each of your examples, you showed the opposite of that. Okay, in what way? Well, because in each of the examples, Iran is an imaginative geography. It's a land that's theirs, that's not ours. In each one, the authors are employing a strategy of differentiation. If there is a claim about identity, it's mm -hmm. identity through difference, not the other way around. Well, there are Michelet, there's a claim of identification of this is our heritage or ancestors, which is equally problematic, but it's all about identifying. It's not about... Other right, identity else. through difference, though. So there is this article by Megan Thomas, uh, Orientalism, and I think it's the politics of comparison, but she yeah. looks at, like, Herder, she looks at Condorcet, she con considers Montesquieu, and basically the argument is a critique of Said, sure. Mm -hmm. Said privileges one strategy of differentiation, mm -hmm. but it's not to disavow... Mm -hmm. Orientalism. Mm -hmm. It's not to appear an apologetic for Orientalism's impediness in relations of power. Yeah. And it seems like to me that coming and saying that these people are mere scholars that are interested in Iran, qua Iran, mm -hmm. is apologia for mm -hmm. the discursive production, discursive productions that are in the interest of, right? Like intentions notwithstanding, good people who want to be scholars, but, you know, the contemplative life is not does not like exist outside of material relations. And I think that's like maybe the more important case that Sai is trying to make. So my question is, how do you reconcile the idea that these people are interested in Iran qua Iran with their entanglement and relations of power with the colony? With, sorry, with Iran, like uh, an unequal, unequal relations of power with Iran, mm -hmm. yeah. There are certainly unequal relationships of power, but what I'm interested in is sort of pushing against a very reductive narrative that this is all fantasy and no relation to reality. Yes, they're dealing with Persian literature. They're not dealing, they're not hanging out uh, with living Iranians. They're reading texts and engaging with texts. But I think that as a proposition is very important because it goes against an assumption of Western superiority. The only literature worth reading is Western. The only cultures that matter are Western. The only religion that's worthy of respect is Christianity. I think it's really radical of these authors to say, no, Christianity sucks. Look at Zoroastrianism. That's, you know, an example of morality. However, you know, reductive it is. Um, with reading the Shahnameh, engaging Shahnameh, it's creating a different literary canon where Persian literature is included as important as Western text. Now, of course, comparison will always be problematic if you start saying, I'm comparing these two, but this one is better. Um, but I don't see that as being the aim of these authors. Um, I deal more with relations of power in a different context. I have a chapter on travel writing, and there, because these are French people in Iran, um, in some cases, appropriating artifacts uh, very literally, uh, but also observing uh, financial imperialism with the British and French presence in Iran. So there, I do look at those aspects. Um, but I find it would be a shame to not study, to not consider this history of reception, creative engagement with Persian literature in the name of saying, well, it's us and them, it's difference. Um, and I found it really helpful when I was sort of starting working on this book, um, reading sort of critical reflections um, on how really Cultural difference and similarity are always negotiated together, um, whether it is, you know, as Vetan Todorov um, arguing that we need to find a balance between universalism and cultural relativism. You can't have just one or the other. Uh, but also study by Adnil Bhatti and Dorote Kimich. Uh, it's a book, edited volume on similarity as an approach for looking at cross-cultural relations. <laughs> I find very often when authors are expressing comparisons, it's not necessarily to say the West is superior. It can be a way of approaching, of introducing Iran to readers unfamiliar with Iranian culture, and in some cases also arguing for the superiority. For example, when they describe Esfahan, they say, you know, look at Louis XIV Versailles. He built a palace that was a mirror to himself. Shah Abbas built a city that was a mirror to his people. 
So that kind of language is not about asserting Western power and dominance, I find. Okay, uh, hi. Uh, I was... <laughs> I was first going to ask yeah. a, a question about the Dreyfus affair, but Sherrick yeah. sort of took that one. And then I was yeah. going to ask a question about Sayyid and Orientalism. And, that uh, was and so, <laughs> well, I'm going to build on that one yeah. a little bit um, and, and you know, push back a little bit about this idea of reading Persian literature on its own terms, you mm -hmm. know, which, which you've yeah. you stated a couple of times. Yeah. And I'm a scholar of Zoroastrianism, yeah. so I'm going to stick with Michelet because this is the yeah. one that's sort of most yeah. familiar to me. Um, so I think, you know, as is, is, as is pretty well known, Anquetil du Perron and yeah. uh, William Jones disagreed a lot about yes. what they thought Zoroastrianism yeah. was. They feuded quite publicly. Mm -hmm. Jones wrote nasty things in yeah. French about uh, Anquetil du Perron. Yeah. And one thing that Anquetil du Perron did when he was translating the Avesta, I think, um, was not to argue that the Avesta preserved some sort of pure sort of Aryan notion of justice yeah. you know, within it, but rather to you know, focus on what the text said about how mm -hmm. liturgies and rituals are performed in India uh, among the Parsis. Jones, on the other hand, had a different idea about what Zoroastrians believed. He didn't think the Avesta was an authentic text at all, um, and you know, really projected this kind of Herderian notion of, of sort of race and nation upon ancient Zoroastrianism. So it seems to me that even though Michelet is writing in the sort of you know French tradition and perhaps you know has read Anquetil du Perron in some way or another, he's really reading Zoroastrianism through Jones's mm -hmm. particular reading of what this is, and you know, it, it would be. I'm wondering, you know, where he ever looks in a text to say that Zoroastrianism is all about, you know, sort of an ancient notion of justice. Maybe this yeah. would be something fruitful to explore and in, in trying to see, you know, what the particular lens that these people yeah. were approaching approaching translation through was. Anyway, thank you yeah, for the great talk. Definitely, yeah. thank you. I think that absolutely makes sense. Yeah, as a suggestion. Thank you so much. This was such a Thank you. Coming and see you next week. Thank you.